I'm Lillian Lodge Copenhaver, Executive Director of the Lillian Lodge Copenhaver Center for the Advancement of Women in Communication, which is located in the College of Communication, Architecture and the Arts here at Florida National University. And I am delighted to welcome you here this rainy morning to our fourth annual national conference, Women in Communication, Shattering the Ceiling. We have an exciting and an, en an enlightening program planned for you throughout the day. I know you are aware that women make up more than half the population of the United States. It is therefore very important that communications in this country represent our population equitably, both in the information that is delivered and in those who deliver that information. Only in this way can we protect and defend our democratic society. We have an awesome group of women with us today who will share their stories and their thoughts about the theme of our conference. How can women move ahead and be heard as we continue the year of the woman? The mission of the Copenhaver Center, and you have a brochure that we've given you to talk a little bit about what the center does, but our mission is to empower both women professionals and academics in all of the fields of communication in order to develop visionaries and leaders who can make a difference in their communities and in their professions. Our conference today will provide us with an opportunity to explore the reality of the role and status of women in communication and chart a pathway to help women realize their potential and become those visionaries and leaders of tomorrow. You will see from your program, if you take a look at it, we have a lunch break from 12.15 to 1.30 when we will begin with our afternoon keynote speaker, Ellen Weiss, Vice President and Washington Bureau Chief of the EW Scripps Company. We will have refreshments for those of you in our audience uh, in the back of the room here during the lunch break, so help yourself. But please hurry back at 1.30 for our, more, our wonderful afternoon program. I would particularly like to thank our sponsors for this event because without their support, we could not put this conference on. I want to say thank you to WPLG Channel 10, to CNN, to Telemundo, to the Miami Herald, to WPBT South Florida, to NBC6 Miami, to the Women's Media Center in Washington, D.C., to Bowdoin, to NBC Universal and MSNBC, to Wells Fargo, to Smith Edwards and Virgil Smith, and to Women in Cable Television. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Brian Schreiner, Dean of the College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts, without whose support this conference and the work of the Copenhagen Center would not be possible. So let's give him a round of applause. Good morning. I'm glad to be here for many, many reasons, but if you'll just look out that window, another reason to be glad that we're inside this morning. So thank you, and I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, there's a few people I want to recognize from the audience that, are, that I'd like for you to get to know as well. Uh, Dwayne Wiles is our VP for alumni. Dwayne. <laughs> Maria Claverly, our uh, Director of Alumni for our college. Oliver Ianita is our development director, and Nance Green, who sits on the uh, Copenhaver board. Thank you. So, so let me start by saying something that's obvious, but probably needs to be repeated many, many times, and that's leadership matters. And Dr. Copenhaver, who for more than 45 years, please, who for more than 45 years has been a tireless advocate of women's rights both locally and nationally, is a true example of intentionality, hard work, and of course, leadership. As an educator, scholar, administrator, and philanthropist, she has paved the way for generations of professionals. Dr. Copenhaver and the Copenhaver Center, which exists through her generosity and her expertise, the important work that they do unite us here today to discuss the representation of women in all aspects of media and communication industries a necessity in order to ensure that all voices and perspectives are heard. The inspirational keynote speakers at today's conference, FIU alumna Diane Festa, NBC Vice President News Partnerships, and Ellen Weiss, EW Scripps Vice President, Washington Bureau Chief, 
and all of our distinguished panelists and professionals participating today demonstrate one thing, that women are already leaders in this industry, but unfortunately not in equal proportions. Today's presentations and discussions will no doubt spark your interest and generate necessary conversations. We are living in a time of significant change. Technology, social norms, labor law, all being impacted. Automated decision making, artificial intelligence, robotics are replacing human beings in the workplace regardless of gender. FIU, and in particular the School of Communication uh, and Journalism, is ahead of the curve with experiential learning based curricula they prepare and graduate students who have the necessary career-ready skills for the 21st century world of work. With a student population in the school that is 70% female and over 85% self-identify as minorities, the school is preparing the future leaders of not just Miami, but nationally and internationally. So while we are all here together as a community, as a university, there is also no mistaking that we are also here as individuals and we have individual responsibilities to do well by doing good. Dr. Copenhaver, our keynote speakers, the professionals and others here can open doors for us. They can serve as role models, but it really is up to each and every one of us individually to seize those opportunities, recognize their efforts, thank them for what they've done, and for each of us to affect change. This conference enables us to take a step in that direction. Again, I want to thank all of you for being here, especially thank Dr. Copenhaver and the Copenhaver Center for giving us this unique opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for those nice words, Dean Schreiner. I now it is my pleasure to introduce our MC for the morning, Stephanie Bertini. Stephanie is a reporter at our NBC6 station here in Miami. Stephanie? Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Great, that's good, but that's not loud enough. If you've been to one of my things that I like to MC, you know that I want energy from the audience. And especially when we're talking about what we're talking about today. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Copenhaver, I can't uh, praise her enough for her tireless efforts, uh, her work, uh, her dedication to promoting the advancement of women in the fields of communication. Um, I've spent more than 12 years working as a journalist in broadcast television, and I love my business today as much as I did uh, when I was a student um, and I was studying and aspiring uh, to work amongst the men and women uh, in that field. Women in particular though, um, I've had some who have mentored me and I've had some who have, I've been able to look up to, including Dr. Copenhaver. But I've also um, experienced the fact that there's just not as many of them in those big leadership roles as there are men. Um, the research that we've done at the center shows that. And it's really just a, a reality of the industry that you know very well uh, if you've worked in it. And when we talk about communication in general uh, and all the different disciplines, so uh, be it print, uh, be it advertising, be it public relations, uh, we're seeing the same sort of thing. And so it's important to come together uh, and to talk about this and to attack that big and major question, what can we do to get women a little further ahead and achieve that equality and achieve that balance. Uh, on behalf of NBC6, um, I'm here um, obviously to MC and moderate our morning panel, but we are also sponsors of this event this year and we're always dedicated to being behind initiatives that better the community. And what better uh, way to better the community than to be uh, in line with an organization that promotes equality and democracy. Uh, Dr. Copenhaver, uh, thank you very much much for putting this together. This is the fourth annual national event and we bring together so many fantastic and amazing professionals from across the country. So it's really an interesting way uh, to kind of come together and, and share ideas. What I love so much about the center uh, is that it, it's, it's twofold in, in the sense that it offers mentorship for women, young women who aspire to work in these fields and it also offers a platform for women like me and the others who you'll hear from today to kind of 
give back. Um, I came to Dr. Copenhaver when I was at a crossroads in my career. I just come to the Miami market and I said to her, you know, I'm at a point where I've received so much and I want to start to share. And she gave me the opportunity to host a live webinar. And she gave me the opportunity to now MC this conference. This is my third year here. And it, it means a lot because what it means is that she's uplifting. And I know that she does that from the bottom of her heart. Our business is important. Um, and communication is vital when it comes to democracy. But equally important is the opportunities that we get to grow. And sometimes in these very niche industries, we can't always find those opportunities. I know for all the students here, I was there before. And it can be intimidating when you're trying to crack uh, a business like television or like radio or like public relations. Networking is easy when people tell you to do it, right, when they're working in the roles. But it's not so easy when you're that student who has no experience. So being here is very important for you and good for all of you who kind of took the the initiative to come. Um, first of all, we want to give a big round of applause to our morning keynote speaker, Diane Festa. She's uh, right here beside me. Thank you for joining us. We know you're a busy lady. So we appreciate you being here. Um, Diane Festa is Senior Vice President of the News Partnerships team at NBC Universal New York, where she works to leverage relationships with NBC owned and affiliated stations, as well as provide editorial content to stations and increase local participation on NBC News projects and major stories. In addition, she was responsible for growing NBC News and MSNBC internationally, working closely with the NBC Universal International team. Prior to FESTA joined the news partnership team, she coordinated the network's election coverage year as political editor for NBC News Decision 96. In 1991, Festa was named the Moscow bureau chief immediately following the fall of the Soviet Union and covered Russia's transition to a market economy until 1995. During her tenure there, she directed coverage of four presidential summits and the war in Chechnya. She was among those nominated for the uh, 1993 Emmy Award for coverage of the October 1993 Moscow revolt. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was weekend news manager in that role, she was responsible for coordinating worldwide news coverage for NBC News programs and specials. During the Persian Gulf War, Festa served as the acting bureau chief in Amman, Jordan. Previously, she worked as an assignment editor in the London Bureau from 1986 to 1989. Diane started her career in 1983, working with NBC affiliates in the Florida region as NBC Miami Bureau Coordinator. She also participated in coverage of the Grenada invasion and the civil wars in El Salvador and Nicaragua. Festa graduated from Florida International University in 1983 <laughs> with a bachelor's in journalism. We are so excited to have her here. Give her a big, loud welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I could not say it better to about Dean Copenhaver. She has been such a, I've been the great beneficiary of having her in my life for so many years. And I would just say to all of you here, tap into her genius because she has made um, my life so fulfilling. And uh, thanks for keep, keep on giving back to everybody uh, and, and the role you play in inspiring women. So thank you for that. Uh, hello to all of you. It's so great to be back on my hometown turf of Miami. I could have had some better weather, thank you. But 40 degrees in New York, you know what? I'm not complaining. Um, I have, first of all, a great turnout. And for those of you all that will be, will be streaming this, right? So we'll see. We'll get to see this. But um, I want to start with a question. And for those of you in the room who, um, who are interested in getting into television news, raise your hand. Okay. How about those of you interested in um, having your first employer be a digital startup? Hmm. Okay. Who wants to run a podcast? Okay. I think television news won. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that Nobody has any idea what our industry will be looking like in five or 10 years from now. Nobody, no idea. But one thing we will know for certain is that journalism 
and what we do every day, journalism, is more important than ever. Even with the, because even as the platforms evolve, the mission of journalism hasn't changed. It has been and always will be to seek the truth. But amidst the cries of fake news, the First Amendment is having a moment. And we're reminded every single day that what we do for a living by holding those in power accountable is critically important. We must remain accurate above all, transparent and relevant to our audience. A couple of weeks ago, I attended the Radio Television News Director's First Amendment Awards in which news, organization, news organizations were honored for seeking and reporting the truth ethically and responsibly. I was representing NBC News and a group called the Road Warriors who were among those winners. These reporters were sent to battleground states in 2018. Their coverage was recognized for its old school reporting, and I mean knocking on the doors, talking to voters about everyday concerns, like job security, family health care coverage, affordable education. Their reporting was less about who was up or down in the polls and more about what people thought regarding kitchen table issues. Incidentally, 18 NBC correspondents were awarded the prize and only four were men. This was groundbreaking and it reflects a steady progress of female journalists on the campaign trail, a beat normally reserved for men. So how did these female political reporters get there? I think they would tell you they stood on the shoulders of women in television news who opened the doors for them years ago. And me, how did I get here? Many, many women, like Dean Copenhaver, before me laid the groundwork for the opportunities I've had too. So let me tell you a little bit about my journey, beginning with FIU. Once upon a time, a South Florida girl, me, left the University of Florida in her senior year. Really, I mean, who does that? Who leaves in their senior year? To transfer to FIU's brand new journalism school under the leadership of Dean Copenhaver, who was quite the trailblazer in our field. At 21, it was the boldest decision I've ever made and turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. Because of FIU, I was able to get hands-on experience and land an internship at NBC News' Miami Bureau. What was it like to be an intern in this bureau? As you may know, Miami is the greatest news town. This was the 1980s and our coverage area not only included Florida where we covered hurricanes, race riots and shuttle launches, but civil wars in Central America. El Salvador and Nicaragua were some of the US's top foreign policy concerns due to the threat of communism. Soon after my internship, the bureau chief and my mentor in this business, Don Brown, offered me an entry-level job in the Miami Bureau. This, this was my big break. I was 23, green, young, and hungry for any opportunity. By the way, I wasn't the only woman in the Miami Bureau. Don had hired a female correspondent, a female producer, a female editor, a female sound technician, and various female support staff. Very progressive. One day, when the entire bureau was off covering other stories, I was asked to go help our producer in the tiny Caribbean country of Grenada. When I was asked to assist, nobody had a clue about what would occur one week later, or for sure they would not have sent me. President Ronald Reagan would order the Marines to invade Grenada in Operation Urgent Fury to secure the safety of nearly 1,000 American medical students and replace the pro-Marxist government. The next thing I knew, I was on an eight, in an ancient cargo plane, a C-130, going from Barbados to Grenada. By the way, we were frustrated as journalists because the administration wouldn't let us go cover the invasion from inside Grenada, so we were shuttled back and forth from Barbados to cover what they wanted us to see. Now, let me explain what a C-130 was like, for those of you who don't know. It's a prop plane used by the armed services. There are no regular seats, your back is up against the wall, and you're strapped in sitting on a bench in the most uncomfortable flight you will ever experience. It rattles and feels like your teeth are chattering the entire time that you're flying. And it was at that very moment that I said, I was born to do this job. I mean, I got to work with smart people on things that mattered, and it was the best of times for network news. And over the next decade, I raised my hand for assignments in London, New York, and Amman, 
And with these postings, not only did I have to learn about the story and meeting the demands of New York, but I had to confront the risks associated with being in these countries. Therein lies a lesson. When I raised my hand and left the comfort of my home to work in these foreign countries, I not only learned a lot about the places, but even more about myself. I bet you're asking yourself now, did I question myself along the way and, and ask, was I really ready for these, for these assignments? Was I afraid I couldn't cut it? Absolutely right. Did I ask myself whether I have the experience for this job or worry that they will find out that I don't? Of course I did. But I allowed my ambition to lead me. I was leaning in long before Sheryl Sandberg coined the term. And my success in this business has been hard work, tenacity, and saying yes to every opportunity. My experience in these foreign posts in New York as NBC's weekend executive in charge of our worldwide coverage gave me the confidence to raise my hand for what would be one of the most coveted jobs in our business and the best assignment of my career, chief of the NBC News Moscow Bureau immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union. There were people higher up the ladder in New York who weren't quite sure I was the right choice. But you're not a Sovietologist. I mean, you haven't, you haven't been here, you haven't studied it, uh, one male colleague told me. And my response was, okay, but there is no more Soviet Union. And there's a whole new oppor opportunity to forge relationships at the Kremlin. Plus, I told him, what I lack in experience, I make up for in moxie. And for those who are unfamiliar with the word moxie, it means having the nerve or chutzpah. Would a man ever describe himself as having moxie? Maybe not. And I probably wouldn't use that word today to describe myself, but that's a difference between now and then. But I had to prove them wrong. And I knew I had to prove to myself that I could handle this major assignment. Well, I earned the respect of my bosses and my peers during my time there. I was 30 years old and the first female bureau chief for NBC News in Moscow. But I was not alone, because women were heading up bureaus in Tokyo, in Germany, and in London at the time. I want to quick paint a quick picture of what working in Moscow was like during this period. It was a tumultuous time. The world watched in amazement as the Soviet Union fell apart into 15 separate countries after 70 years of communism. I was watching a country try to figure out what it was and where it was going. My first night there, I was in Red Square as the Soviet flag with its hammer and sickle symbol of communism came down and the new Russian flag was hoisted. People were popping champagne all around. Their euphoria was infectious. There was so much hope for their new country, but that euphoria was short-lived. These reforms were so brutal and resulted in a political crisis in which the Russian parliament was dissolved, street riots broke out, and President Yeltsin ordered the army to storm the parliament building, also known as the White House. And by the way, I lived next door to the White House, but I was holed up in the office for days because there were tanks on the streets, gunfire and blockades prevented me from going home. So one night during the siege, our cameraman needed a replacement battery. So I decided to head over to the parliament as we couldn't afford not to tell the story from inside the building. Our radio reporter and I walked to the White House, past the tanks, blanketing the streets, jumped over the barricades and wire, and came face to face with an armed Russian soldier brandishing a Kalashnikov rifle. I will not lie, I was terrified. But when he said, niet, to us entering, I said, da, journalisti. And that 10-day conflict became the deadliest since the Russian Revolution in 1917. 186 people were killed. When it was over, I finally got back to my apartment. Remember I said I lived next door. When I walked in, I found two bullets in my bed, strays from the sniper fire. I thanked my lucky stars I was not there, had a shot of vodka, and went to sleep. On a personal note, I was in a relationship when I got my Moscow assignment with someone who wasn't working for NBC but was in the business. When it came to time, when it came to whether he would accompany me to Moscow, I had to say no. It was critically important for me to be evaluated on my own terms to cover this important story for the news division. And I didn't want to have the optics appear that I was leaning 
on anyone's shoulder. Others said to me, wouldn't it be so nice to have somebody there um, as you take on this huge responsibility? Maybe, but in retrospect, I know I did the right thing. Following Moscow, I was approached by my boss to do something completely different, and that was to work with our NBC News programs and our NBC stations. I'd been living overseas for seven years, and I thought this might be a good opportunity for me to have some balance in my life. We're gonna talk about balance now. Uh, while learning about the business of journalism, I knew I didn't want to be a news nun. What's a news nun? Think about it for a minute. I wanted a chance to have a family, and this gave me an opportunity to do that. So I took the job, and about a year later, I was offered a chance to go after the London Bureau Chief's position, which was my coveted job. Um, and it killed me, but I had to say no. I really was committed to starting a family. So these are two career decisions that are examples of sacrifices women, we women have to make. Do we think a man would have been concerned about having his girlfriend posted in Moscow? that it could reflect negatively on his confidence and abilities. And the decision to, ch to choose the possibility of a family over a dream job in London is an example of some of the hard balance calls women have to make. And not that I regret that call, and I don't think my teenage son Lucas does either. So let's talk a bit, a bit about what it was like to operate in a male-dominated business where for many years I was one of the few women at the table. And here's how I believe some women adjusted to the culture in a man's world a couple of decades ago. There were several roles to choose from, and whether this is a subtle approach or, a more, or, or more overt, I'm not really sure. But in order for women to be accepted into the male-dominated club, they were either one of the guys, needing to be as tough as the men in the group, or the worker bee, who Holly Hunter portrayed as a network news producer in the movie Broadcast News, or the girl next door who threatens nobody. I'm sure there are more too. Um, me, I went with the worker bee, the one who would be the first to arrive and the last to leave the office, the one always trying to go above and beyond what was asked, the one with her hand up and always saying, yes, yeah, let me do this. But as I think about the new framework for women in a post Me Too movement, women have to be able to be themselves and not play a role that someone else, almost always a man, thinks they should play. Women have to have the freedom to speak truth to power, stand their ground, own their space, and know they belong. And most importantly, women have to feel safe in the workplace, and it has to be a place where suggestive comments aren't tolerated, or men making women feel uncomfortable cannot happen. Thank goodness we have so many companies addressing the issue of sexual harassment, so this generation, your generation, and the next will not have to face this kind of behavior in the workplace. I'm thankful that the company I work for is looking at where we are in serving not only women, but other diverse groups as well, and launching new programs to address the inequities. Let me say a few more words about the importance of diversity in our newsrooms, as Dean Schreiner spoke about. We need to have reporters, editors, executives who could see the world differently, whether that's based on gender or race or ethnicity or socioeconomic backgrounds. The demographics of the newsroom should like, look like the people in the communities that we cover. Having diverse news organizations not only makes our stories richer and different, but rebuilds public trust when you represent the voices of all Americans. But decades of acculturation don't change overnight. Women may still be second-guessed and not given assignments over men in our industry. However, it's really important to recognize the big changes. I look at where I work and I am so thrilled for how many of my fellow female colleagues are in leadership positions. Executive producers of the Today Show, executive producer of Nightly News, Dateline, the first female broadcast network news president, head of MSNBC Daytime, head of NBCNews.com, head of our political coverage, et cetera. We're still working on it, but it is a far better day for women. The NBC News president recently called heads of teams into his office, many of the ones that I just mentioned, and someone took note of the sole man in the meeting surrounded by female decision makers who said, my, how times have changed. The ladies are taking over. And one of those women later commented, 
That's because the women get things done. My journey has been an amazing one. Your generation and you can be equally amazing. But it's important to understand, as I referenced up front, that all of us are standing on the shoulders of our female predecessors before us. I look at NBC's Andrea Mitchell, one of the first women to break into broadcasting. And it was she who paved the way for so many female journalists, including those road warriors. I'm sure this is gonna be hard for you to believe, but there was just one female White House reporter, Helen Thomas, for a long time. She covered 10 presidents in that role, and for many years as the only woman in the room. I know it sounds crazy, particularly as you look at the White House briefings today, and there's so many female correspondents. But that's in my lifetime. We are all the beneficiaries of women like Andrea Mitchell and Helen Thomas. So as we have the conversation today, you need to know that you are connected to something bigger. It's not often that you find yourself in an important moment of history as you find yourself right now and find yourself in a position to make history as well. I hope that happens for all of you. Thank you. I, I, I know we're going to take a couple of questions. I wanted to just give a couple of practical points because I know uh, I want to teachable things for me in my uh, career. So um, let me leave you with a few practical pointers. You can feel free to use them now or as you develop throughout your career, but um, they work for me. So right now, start raising your hand for any and every opportunity that comes your way. You're not only gonna learn something about yourself or learn, learn something brand new, but it may open doors you never knew were there. This glass ceiling we're talking about, that's how I shattered it, by saying yes to every opportunity. Number two, curiosity. Absolutely one of the most important traits in journalism. Ever, do you ever hear the uh, expression, curiosity killed the cat? And lack of curiosity killed the reporter? Intellectual curiosity will make you dig deeper and challenge assumptions. Be relentless, relentless in asking questions. And it's really plain and simple. If you're not curious, I think you should consider another profession. Mentorship and networking. That's what, what Steph, you're talking about. I, I realize you've heard about the value of mentors, and I'm the great beneficiary of having a mentor who was really a game changer in network news. Um, but a mentor doesn't have to be somebody who's your senior. I've talked to people who have had mentors who were their peers, but they had different set of skill sets than they had. So all I would say is tap into whoever it is that you feel that you can uh, gain something from their experience and uh, give back as well. Um, and networking, I can't say enough about that. Um, otherwise, how do you find your way in a big company, right? Um, network, and you cannot underestimate how many people want to help you. I mean the most senior correspondents and executives say to me, I will, you know, I love seeing that, uh, that drive, that initiative, be a self-starter. So there's just a few that I pass on to you. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Diane Festa. So we are gonna have some time for Q&A, so we're gonna ask you if you don't mind, maybe you can just sit right in the center here, and I'm gonna give you this microphone. So um, whoever has questions, uh, we're going to actually form a, a line if we can. You could start with a show of hands, whoever wants to start. We have a mic going around, and then we'll kind of just pass it uh, down the line. Does that make sense? So who wants to start us off with some questions for uh, Diane? Hello. Hello. My name is Daniela. Um, I agree with the mentorship pro um, situation. However, there's times where I feel like being, having a mentor is not the ideal situation in most cases. So I say that, like, I take what you said about mentorship as, like, it's a give or take because I feel that I don't need a mentor. But if someone else might be like, I should mentor you. So what should I do as someone that feels like I'm my own leader? That, like, a lot of people are coming to me, go this way, go this way, when I want to go my own way. 
first of all, hats off to you. You want to go your own way, and you are a self-starter, starter, so you're, you're ahead of the game. Um, I would just say there must be some folks uh, that you are looking to gain knowledge from, some, um, some people that are in your, in your immediate space that you're thinking, hmm, I could learn something. It doesn't have to be a full-fledged mentorship program, a mentorship role where you, it could be much more informal. I think some people take it that, oh my gosh, that we've got to meet every month and it becomes sort of a chore and I've got to do this. But I think there's nuggets that you can take throughout the entire time. And, and I would seize that opportunity. It might be that you're watching um, uh, you know, a producer in action and you're thinking, how did they do that? It might be an editor that you're, you're watching a story be cut uh, in, and you can tap into to what they're doing. But I think that, I think it goes a little bit back to my um, point on curiosity, because there is so much to learn from so many different people. Um, and again, I would just reiterate that it does not have to be that formal, older, senior mentor role, because I think across the spectrum that you're gonna be able to learn something from everybody. And I would just encourage you, it sounds like you, you're, terrific mentor too, so um, invite people to, to learn from you as well. Uh, anyone else here might have a question? Right here, up the middle. Hello, my name is Antonella. Um, I wanted to know what's some advice that you can give to someone trying to get into the media industry that may not have all the experience that is required in every job posting that they have? To get into the media in industry? Mm -hmm. I say start at the any level that you can enter. I would say that um, so many people get wrapped up in, okay, well, I don't have the experience of, um, of editing. I, I don't have the experience of shooting. And But I will tell you one thing that's really, really important for whatever job you do in the media is be a writer and learn your skills at writing. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I think Ellen would agree with that too. I think um, it's just, it's sort of a, the bare, bare minimum. And I, and I just think that, um, you know, it could be, it could be um, a page at NBC, for example, where, um, not to toot my company's horn, but like a, there's so many people that got through um, by getting an assignment at, a, at, a, at one of our shows and then came through the path that way. Internships, I'm huge on internships. The reason I'm sitting here before you today is because I had the internship through FIU at the NBC office. And I just, you know, that's critical. I think there's been so much talk about where you go to college and what you, you know, um, <clears throat> what you're studying. But I would say a game changer also could be, um, is rather, where you, you know, where you've interned. And so pursue those, particularly in your last two years. Um, and then you'll network when you get, when you get that internship, you'll, you'll, meet people and I can't tell you how many people follow up after an internship to me and say, you know, um, I'm available, but, um, and just peruse all the different websites because you don't know. It's like when we started this, this conversation, some of you raised your hand for the news, some digital startups podcast. You don't know what platform you're going to end up on, but you do know one thing. You want to be in journalism and you, that's why you need to write. Going off of that question, before we go to the next uh, person, uh, maybe you can um, elaborate a bit, Diane. You talked about um, that that sort of um, situation where you have to continue to prove, you know, you have what it takes. Or what I'm getting at is, even when we're in the industry, television, for example, our business, you still don't have the experience as you continue to climb, or you might feel that way. Uh, can you talk about that a bit, sort of maneuvering and navigating in the industry? when you're in there, because I think we don't talk about that enough. We talk about breaking in, but what about when you're in? That's a good, good excellent question. Um, I think for me, and then I'll address it more generally, but for me, what was um, exciting and worked for me is that in a way, by raising my hand to different postings and going um, and, and trying something in different countries and getting that experience, that hands-on experience and covering stories mm -hmm. um, was such a growth experience. So it may have been um, some of them were maybe lateral moves, and it wasn't necessarily up there. But as you gain more experience, it's going to allow you to get go um, further in your career. Um, I also think that not enough is said about when you get into a position and you feel like you're stagnated a little bit, like where am I going here? Um, I think that you should be ready to take a major detour. 
In other words, if you're working in, um, you know, this the grind of day-to-day -day news, you might say, you know what, I've kind of exhausted this. I've learned everything I can. Why don't I try, try something at uh, long form, mm -hmm. magazine show, or why don't I try um, working for dot coms? And so I think the idea is just be open to trying all sorts of different platforms. And, and uh, it's, as I said, it's just about making sure you are positioning yourself with the right people um, and I, I, you know, I just be continually saying, I've got to grow, right. I've got to learn, I'm going to raise my hand, and um, hard work, and be the first to arrive and the last to leave. Because, I, you know, it's funny, when, we, yeah. when I talk to people, my colleagues, they will remark that, wow, that person is just relentless about, you know, being here, and, and, and it sounds so easy, it really does, like that's all you need to do is show up. No, you have to, you have to um, be able to do a lot once you show up, but it gets noticed, especially by people, some of the senior people who really just want somebody there to be able to um, take care of uh, working with them on scripts and take care of them throughout the, the entire process and is not running off and I gotta go make my dinner. Um, so, you know. The, uh, there's that balance that's going to come in your life. I used the first, I'd say, first half of my career to focus heavily in terms of just putting my personal life, as you heard, to the side. And um, going off of that, uh, if you could address for the audience, so the center, the last research uh, that was done, they found out a couple things about women, including the fact that more women than men had said they worked less time in their field because of career interruptions. You touched on that, um, having your son who's 17 now. Can you sort of um, elaborate on that point a little more? And it is a reality of our gender, I guess. So let, let's talk about that. A yeah, bit. it is a reality. And um, I think more and more companies are addressing that. That. Um, I can tell you in our company we have a um, we have a few programs. We have a job sharing program where women working mothers are able to um, share responsibilities. So, if, for example, um, there's two editors who split the yeah. week and they're able to do that. Um, we have a new program. Well, it's it's been around, but it's been sort of beefed up called the Returnees Program. So, I actually just hired somebody who'd been out of the workforce. She had worked for about ten years. She went off and had three children, and she's been out of work for six years, and I just brought her back into my department. And um, I, think, I think a lot more companies are looking at working within the confines of, of women wanting to start a family, because why should, why should it end there? I mean, it, absolutely not. I, I, I really feel good about the direction. We're not there yet, absolutely not. But I feel good about that there's been enough um, uh, talented people that why should we lose out on these incredible women because they want to go and do something yeah, and, and have a family so i think it's crucial too to see women like yourself in, in high ranking positions who have kind of done it and and still been able to grow and, and do magnificent things in their career and that's Thank why you. it's such a good example to have you here uh, any other questions from the audience um right here yeah. my son is is 20 and i at the same time where that was really what was it took to be successful. How do you teach that lesson to your teenage son? Oh my gosh. That is <laughs> Does anyone have any ideas? Because I was 17. <laughs> because um, I talk and I talk. See. I tell the same story you tell. Yeah. And it's on a deaf ear. I know. I know. It's, um, it's true. I'm trying. I'm tr I try. I, I try to tell my um, I try to tell my son it's really, it's when I hire people to, I look at people who have grit. I look at people who have tenacity that will not give up. I had a, a little uh, lesson when I was an intern. I, um, I was asked to research a story um, and I came back and I said, you know, they, we were trying to get these people on, on the Today Show and um, I said, they, will, they're, they're, they won't go. And how many people did you, how many people did you, how many calls did you make? I said, seven, eight. And they're like, Come back when you've made 25 or 30, and then if they still say no, make another. There are different sources, obviously, but it's that, it's that, that relentlessness, that yeah. tenacity, that grit, that drive. Um, that is going to set you apart from, I think, other people. And that's a, that, 
people say, can you teach grit? There's been books written on that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if you can, but you can hopefully inspire, and I would, I would encourage you to, I'm sure you are encouraging that with your son. I'm doing the same, and let's, let's uh, report back and <laughs> see if it worked, but yeah. Because you want the next generation to continue this and have that ballad of hard work and work ethic. Yeah. Yet, it's a very hard thing to do. It's, it's, it's hard, but um, I believe, I believe in this generation. I think they have so many wonderful opportunities I never had. Um, and, uh, and, and our, this industry is really, this is not only, you've heard people talk about the golden age of journalism we're in now, um, there's been a couple different points of golden age of journalism, but we are really at an exciting time and, and, and it's, um, it's changing. So I think that the, 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 um, I just think the values, it doesn't matter what platform it is or what you're doing, those values have to remain the same. So, yeah, I'm with grit. Go with grit. Great. I think we had a question um, a couple rows back. Yeah. Thank you. Diane, welcome to FIU again. Thank you. <laughs> Great you're to welcome. be back. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about um, how you had to give up that dream job and position mm. to take on motherhood. Um, are big media companies like, for example, NBC doing anything to guide women to these positions without having to choose one or another? I think we've become much better about that these days. I mean, the, the one thing might, this might remain the same today in that that was taking me um, into London into moving, moving um, into another foreign posting. And I knew that I, it was probably more of a personal decision that I wanted to have a family here in the States. But um, in no means, I mean, we have support staff that would encourage you to have a family. Um, I mean, be, be able to do the job and have the family. But I, I'll be honest with you. There are, some, there are some jobs where the time difference doesn't really, you, you really have to make a choice here. I, I don't know that that has changed. So for example, there's an eight hour difference in Moscow and New York. Like you have to be, it's, it's a long, long day. And so you have to think hard about, do I want that? That's, that's, that's the nature of that posting. So I'm sure there's some jobs that just may not lend itself to the family, but I think the yeah. company is very, very interested in finding creative ways to allow for, um, as I said, this job sharing, the returnees, and these, and these innovative ways of designing programs to accommodate smart and talented women that they want to see rise through the ranks. And through your experience working with other women and obviously yourself, um, little parenthesis, we were speaking um, with one of our professors in class. She noted that in the classroom, it was one male journalism student, the rest were females, mm. and pointed out that if that is how we're divided in the field, then there should be more women in leadership positions. Now, do you think that also women are afraid to go after those positions? Do you think that there's anything that's keeping that ratio for also showing in top um, leadership? I, I, and I, I don't want to repeat myself, but I have to look kind of where I've been and where I am now. And I have to look around, and I can tell you, it is this. This, this is not a joke. The, there was one gentleman in a senior position, and every other leadership decision maker was a was a was a woman. So, um, and it's like, wow, now you know what it felt like. Um, but so I think people are raising their hands more. I think that there is a a concerted effort in the company to identify talented women and work with them and provide um, resources to them to bring them up through the ranks. But yes, I mean, are women intimidated of doing? Uh, perhaps, perhaps. But I think as they see more and more evidence of their fellow female um, leaders or somebody they look up to, they'll be less, they'll be more inclined to raise their hand, I think. We have a question over here. Oh, go ahead, yes, and then we'll move over. I just want Hi. to thank you for telling your story today. It was really thank inspirational. Um, oh, good. But I just, you touched on being a worker bee. Yes. And 
where do you draw the line? Because sometimes mm. you're the worker bee, you're the first one there, you're the last one out, you're working hours and hours on, and then it's like, it's not appreciated. You don't see yourself going anywhere. Hmm. Um, and it's tough. It's like you're hitting a wall. Oh, that's a really good question. I, where do you draw the line at worker bee? Um, I don't, I, yeah. Hmm. It's it worked so well for me that um, just I guess it depends for for to what end. I think somewhat you have to attach yourself to somebody who is really going to notice and appreciate it. I mean, um, if you're just doing it and like nobody's taking you know note of how much time you're spending and and so that's again a little bit more connected to the networking and making sure that whatever you do is. Um, is appreciated and 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 noted and commented on. So I, maybe you give yourself a a, a time, a, a you know, a, a window of when you think, okay, I've I've learned enough. I need to move on. But don't let them take you for granted. Don't let them um, not recognize you because yeah, you don't you don't you've got to be able to move up. Thank so you. you're welcome. Well, we're gonna go over there. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that journalism uh, maintains accountability. And I'm wondering with um, much of the media shrinking, uh, departments downsizing, how does that impact accountability in our democracy? It's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, you're right. There are, there are, um, there are areas certainly that that NBC News has um, had to, to, as they have more partnerships, they've had to consolidate, whether that's foreign bureaus. Oh my God, we used to have 20 of them. Now we have so many fewer bureaus. Um, but what we do have is um, we are really making a concerted effort to have more voices than we've ever had before. And what I mean by that is representation. We are not there yet. We are not there, but we are... Uh, I don't think anybody in the in the media industry is quite where they want to be in terms of having, as I spoke about, the the voices and the diversity in the newsrooms because I think that's the future. I think that's what's going to, and that's a that's a different um, that's a different dynamic than what we what, what I had in my career growing up. I mean, I think um, as we as as I've talked about, and I'm not just talking about gender. I'm talking about, um, as I mentioned, all uh, the socioeconomic the the ethnicity, because we just, I think you're going to be limited on what you can cover um, or, the, or the, the public's trust of you if you are not represented. Um, and that has nothing to do with dwindling resources. It means the resources that you have in there should be representative. So um, I think it's about making more smart choices. That's a good point. Uh, do we have any other questions in the audience? We have one up here. Thank you, Thank you again. Um, I think you. your story is really inspirational, so thank, thank you again you. for uh, sharing that. I guess my question, you've kind of addressed it um, with a motherhood question. Mm. What recommendations as a hiring manager do you have for someone that's a journalist? Maybe they've been in the field for a few years, but for one reason or another, they've been out of the field for a couple years. What do you recommend? What's the best way to get kind of back in and um, you know, if maybe they didn't take a break to have a child, which is kind of the typical story that, you know, um, women, you know, go through. So what, what recommendations do you have for someone like that? Yeah, it's, uh, and I don't know how many companies have formal programs where we call it the returnee program, but um, as I mentioned, we, we do. Um, we, what, what I think I would do is if you are looking to go back into that same organization, um, I would just go back to the people that know you, because I've had a lot of people, uh, you know, executive producers say to me, hey, do you, do you need somebody? Uh, because this person was fantastic. She's been out of the workforce for four or five years. But so they went back to the person that there was their, you know, their, their boss or their, um, somebody who believed in them. So, so number one, go back to networking who you know. And even if it's not for the same company, because it's a, sort of an incestuous world we're in, media, um, where we know people from different companies. Again, I'm talking about the um, television news business, but um, still start that way because that's, that's a good hook. Um, the other thing I would say about a 
um, returnee or somebody who's got a family now is I would just implore every hiring person um, out there to be flexible on the working hours of somebody. I'm going to give you an example. The returnee I hired has three children. She's got an hour and a half commute to the city. Um, so she's on a bus three hours a day. Um, there's a lot of work she can, and she, you know, her kids get sick and she has to admit, I am all about, all about flexibility um, in terms of, yes, you can work from home. There are so many things you can do from home. Um, as long as the work gets done, I'm okay. Now, I'm not saying don't come into the office, but I, uh, I think, you know, I have another person on my team who also is commuting every, um, every week from Charlotte to New York because he didn't want to move his family um, to, uh, to the city at three, three kids in high school. So um, again, there's, that is the future. We have to be flexible because if you've got great people out there, they have lives. They have lives and it's all about the balance in our lives. And um, so, yeah, I would uh, encourage you to come back. We have any other questions in the audience? So Diane, to wrap this, I would ask you, can you address morale, and not from a company standpoint, but from an individual standpoint, and I'm talking about, you talked a lot about your individual journey in television yeah. news. Talk about other individual journeys and how to kind of you know, keep yourself motivated, keep yourself engaged. And I mean, because you got to admit, throughout that tremendous career you've had, there has to be those moments where you kind of take a step back and you think, yes, I love this. Yes, I have so much momentum towards my goals and, and what I'm trying to do. But there are those moments where you have those tough questions or your personal life kicks in, or maybe just you don't feel in certain years or in certain seasons as motivated as you might have. Um, can you talk about that a bit uh, for for the, our audience? Yeah, I mean, I think it I think it also goes back to what I said uh, earlier, which is if you're in a position where you're not feeling that you have growth potential, and you're doing something and you're thinking, okay, I've done this for four or five years, I see no avenue. Take a diversion, take a left or right turn that you thought I'm just going to try this because it's going to be uh, something. It's it's, it's going to be in, maybe inspiration. It might be a wrong turn. But if you are feeling stagnated and unmotivated, as you say, you have got to try something completely out of your comfort zone. Okay. Um, I have known so many people that have done that and have come back and found their true love. You know, So um, I know sometimes it sounds easier said than done, but um, as, I, as we all know, there are so many avenues in our industry now to pursue. So, And some will come up in the future. We don't and even know about them know. yet. Right. <laughs> we, don't we don't know, even know what it's going to look like five or ten years from now. Ladies so. and gentlemen, please give Diane Fest a big round of Thank applause. You. Thank you. We are you. so happy. Thank you so much. And What an honor to have you here, really. Yeah. We're so happy you were able to join well, us this morning. Honor to be back here at FIU. And I just would encourage all of you, just um, go for it and get that grit and inspire your son and also inspire mine. But just go for everything that comes your way. Internships, curiosity, saying yes. So thank you to Dean Copenhaver. Thank you so much, Dean Schreiner, and to you. Thank right. you so much, Stephanie. All right. Uh, louder. I talked to you guys about this at the beginning. Thank you. That was wonderful.